All right, let's move on to uh, our next resolution. Uh, and that resolution, you know, really touches on, on one of the things that we have all seen over the last several months in the cell phone videos. And it's the, the sort of equipment that we see police uh, using in confrontations with large groups of people, uh, also, some of the tactics that they're using in those confrontations. What we've seen for, for many civilians, it's, it's a little bit of a revelation to us, and it's also the joint jumping off point for our next resolution, which Surar will argue first. And that resolution is the police have become too militarized. Sue, are you a yes or a no on that? In the arena of equipment, I say no, but in the arena of a militarized culture, I say yes. Hmm. Police are, police are working in one of the most heavily armed countries in the world, and they have to be able to protect themselves and others. Equipment like armored personnel carriers and helicopters are critically important to rescue missions and to apprehend dangerous criminals and to rescue people. When I was sheriff in the metropolitan area, we relied on our helicopter to rescue hikers and to track down suspects. We absolutely needed an armor, armored personnel carrier to manage dangerous situations involving hostages and armed people who were barricaded. We couldn't get to them to begin negotiating unless we had that armored personnel carrier. I acquired dozens and dozens of military rifles, not because they were more lethal. They were less lethal than what was available in the local gun store, but what they were was free. And I couldn't afford to buy enough rifles for my officers. Police officers know in many situations, rifles are much safer to use than handguns. The problem with military equipment is not the equipment itself, it's the way it's used and the way it's displayed, which gets us to the culture. Creating, <laughs> creating the image of the police engaged in war began in the 70s with the war on drugs, the war on crime. It exploded in not after 9-11 with the war on terror. It's a political movement that morphed into popular culture. Remember the TV show SWAT? I don't know if anybody else is as old as me that remembers that. And, and that image was warmly embraced by the profession. We need to work intentionally to reclaim the culture of service and protection. The problem isn't the equipment, the problem is the culture. Thank you, Sue Rar. Um, the resolution, again, the police have become too militarized. Vikrant Reddy, are you a yes or a no on that? I mean, yes. I often think on this issue about a, a passage in the Odyssey, actually, in this moment, in the Odyssey, Odysseus is about to host a banquet, and he tells his son at the banquet, you've got to confiscate all the men's swords. And his son asks him why he says, and I remember this line, because the sword itself incites to violence. Mm. The very act of holding the blade, the very act of holding a weapon, makes a person want to use it. You give all these police officers, very frequently young men, by the way, all these really interesting, fascinating weapons that were used in places like the Battle of Fallujah, they are looking for opportunities to use those weapons. They have uh, adopted a kind of warrior mindset whenever they're carrying these weapons around. Also note, by the way, that it's, it goes beyond being a matter of culture. It is a matter of the equipment itself. If you've got an extremely heavy gun, one that you need both hands to hold, uh, you can't be in a position where you're holding a gun with one hand, but trying to de-escalate or wave off the situation with the other. Uh, there are all sorts of ways in which the policing culture and the policing equipment just exhibit successive militarization. We could talk about the uniforms. I don't understand why police officers are frequently wearing camouflage. There are no jungles in downtown Houston or Omaha or Minneapolis. You see that sort of thing. I think we ought to be looking at uh, the ways in which we use SWAT, whether or not that's being used too frequently. I think we should look at use of force uh, training and tactics. If the person you're going after pulls out a gun, then sure, the police officer probably needs to pull out a gun. But if the person you're going after pulls out a baseball bat, do you need to pull out a gun? What is the police department's policy on that? Police departments should be reviewing all of these things because the militarization that's overtaken policing is a problem. Thank you. We have the police have become too militarized. We have a yes and a no so far. Now into Paul Butler. On the police have become too militarized. Paul Butler, are you a yes or a no? I'm a yes with a shout out to whoever made this question last because it perfectly combines all of the other issues that we've debated about why the police uh, need to be defunded in the sense of having some of their money reallocated to social services, the problem with police unions. People know about this 1033 program where police departments got surplus military equipment from the Pentagon. And people think that President Obama stopped the program. 
He didn't. All he did was say that certain weapons like tanks and grenade launchers and bayonets were off limit. Fast forward to the Trump presidency, the Fraternal Order of Police National Convention, the Attorney General of the United States goes in like a conquering warrior and says, guess what? We've reinstated the program. You get your grenades, you get your tanks, and you get your bayonets back. Uh, the reports say that the audience of police officers stood up and cheered. What the hell do police need with a bayonet? How in the hell are they going to use that? The only thing that I know for sure is that the people who are most likely to be victims are black and brown people. We talk about SWATs. So SWAT stands now for Special Weapons and Special Weapons Assistant Team. Uh, originally, the guy who came up with the acronym, the former police chief of Los Angeles, he wanted it to stand for Special Weapon Attack Team. They thought that that sounded too bad, so that's why they changed the name. But that gives you a sense of the problem, the cultural problem that Sue has done really good work on. The problem is that police officers think of themselves as warriors. It's us against them, and them is we the people. Or we the people where the police are supposed to serve and protect. So if you think about somebody who applies for a job to be a warrior, as opposed to somebody who applies to be a guardian, it's a whole different skill set. It's a whole different reason why you want to do the work. All right, Paul, I have to, I have to break in in the interest of time, but thank you very much for, for your opening statement. Uh, again, the resolution, the police have become too militarized. Our next speaker, Jason Johnson, you get your 90 seconds now. Uh, no. Um, you're, you're a no. But my, thoughts, my thoughts overlap to a great extent with, with those of Sue Rara. I do agree that there are certain cultural issues in policing that uh, have become, you know, I don't know if militarized is the right term, but they don't square with what is uh, the most effective approach to serve the community and, and all the different ways that law enforcement organizations and officers are, are asked to serve the community. With respect to some of my um, my colleagues here on the panel that, are, that voted yes for this motion, who I have incredible respect for, I think in some ways it's a little bit naive. Uh, you know, we, we're in a country that has about 15 million military style assault weapons out there in, in general circulation. Uh, last year in 2019, there were 417 mass shootings. We still face the, the risk of, of terrorism that local law enforcement is a first responder to. Um, and our officers need to be prepared to address uh, just even a routine a hostage barricade situation. There is no one else that's going to respond to that. They're, 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 the, the social workers and the addiction counselors and, and everyone else is not going to respond to and address that situation. It's going to be local law enforcement. They need to be properly trained, properly equipped. That may include uh, having a SWAT team. They may be wearing green BDUs. Uh, but there's a reason for that. They may be operating an armored personnel carrier that they got from the federal government. It won't have a, a gun on the turret, but it will be armored and it will allow negotiators to get to right in front of the hostage taker and, and engage in a dialogue. There will be medical professionals as part of that SWAT team, as most SWAT teams are now in, incorporating and embedding uh, medical professionals, including mental health professionals and others as a blended response. And th these are all good things. But I think to just say that uh, it's militarized based on anecdotal uh, information, observations that I would I would say in, in many ways are naive is uh, is not the right approach here. I think we need to look at each individual. If we're talking about militarization, we need to look at each individual aspect of that and determine whether it makes sense or it doesn't. I agree with Sue that it's mostly cultural. Thank you, Jason Johnson. And our last debater on this resolution, Rafael Mangual. Uh, the police have become too militarized. Are you a yes or a no? I am a no, and I'm a no as to both uh, equipment and culture, simply okay. for the reason that uh, there's just no evidence in, in the available data. And, you know, again, I'm going to rely on empirics here. You know, we heard that this is a trend that started culturally in the 1970s. But if we look at major city uses of force, what we don't see is any correlation with the use of force and that kind of attitudinal shift. In 1971, the NYPD uh, shot and injured 221 people. By 2016, that number was down to 72. In Chicago, between 1974 and 1978, police shot approximately 131 people per year. In 2018, that number was just down to 43. We heard about SWAT 
Well, let's look at SWAT involvement in cities across the United States. Within the NYPD, ESU officers, emergency service units, which is our, our SWAT team here, uh, and in 2019 did not record a single shooting. In 2018, ESU officers were involved in just one shooting. In 2017, just two. In Chicago, SWAT teams filed just 26, or 0.003% of the department's 10,068 tactical responses they have to follow when uh, a use of force like a punch, a kick, or a gunshot is recorded. If we consider a, a comparison, an international comparison between us and the UK, we do not see uh, varying rates of, of, of uh, civilian complaints with respect to police use of force. The rate here in the United States is 7.5 force complaints for 100,000 officers. In the UK, where most officers are not even armed, it is 7.5 two for 100,000 officers. As to the 1033 program, there have been multiple empirical analyses of these. I'll quickly, I know I'm out of time, talk about three. What they all found was that uh, the 1033 program is associated with declines in officer injury, declines in officer uses of deadly force, declines in suspect injury, particularly because of the mechanism of deterrence, and there actually is some evidence uh, for this, as Rick Rott noted, from the uniform literature, which actually shows that the police are communicating outwardly uh, a sense of authority, that people respond to that by uh, disengaging violently uh, or being less likely to engage violently. All right, let's move on to that means let's move on to some general discussion. But Raphael, while we do that, I, I just want to ask you: Can I summarize the point you just came with numbers on on yes. for your argument? Can I summarize that by your saying that in general? compared to, say, 20, 30 years ago, that there is less violence in the interactions between police and the population than there was 20 or 30 years ago? There's less violence? That's right. All right. I want to, take, I want to take that. I want to know, number one, I, I want to take it to Vikrant. Do, do you challenge that assertion? And if you don't, does did, did Raphael just blow up the whole notion that the militarization issue is one of concern at all, that militarization is, as Jason had said, the wrong word here? No, not well. Let me begin by saying that I I don't challenge the assertion that there is, uh, you know, less police violence uh, than there had been at periods in the past that Raphael is talking about. I, I think that is true, and, and I think I believe Raphael has written about this to some extent. What we are seeing is concerns that are erupting because of things like viral videos. Now, having said that, I don't think that that blows up the argument. These uh, these instances of violence do happen, and uh, they still happen more frequently than I would like to see them happening. They should be reduced. It's also true that uh, we do have these viral videos, and like it or not, uh, they're out there, and they really, really damage police community relationships. Police officers should be the very first ones saying, we want to do everything we can to ensure that we have good relationships with the members of the community, that they don't view us as warriors, that they do view us as guardians, they view us as protectors and helpers. And these really terrifying weapons don't help that process. I should note, by the way, that I, I take Jason's point that um, we live in a uniquely militarized society of uh, civilian militarization. It's not Japan, it's not Belgium. We're never going to have uh, that kind of reduction in police militarization. But you can still have reasonable limits on these things. I read stories about uh, the city of Keene, New Hampshire, population 24,000, having an armored tank to guard its pumpkin festival. <laughs> Those kinds of things happen. Those are real. It's a real story. And, you know, you might say in response, well, you know, there is a terrorism concern there. I think the way that you handle terrorism is that you're a realist about the fact that, yes, some police departments are going to need very sophisticated weapons. Yes, New York and L.A. and Chicago, these places can serve as nodes and you can very rapidly deliver these weapons to places that need them if they happen to be needed in a small uh, suburban or rural area. Okay. But the idea that you would give those weapons to 12,000 or 18,000 different police departments, so, I just don't see that as let me bring in. Let me bring in Surar. I just want to, I just want to clarify something. <clears throat> we don't, police officers, we're not saying they have to be either warriors or guardians. They have to combine both. Mm -hmm. They have to see themselves serving the role of a guardian that they must also have warrior skills, warrior courage, and warrior equipment. The problem we have with the appearance of over-militarized police is a failure of leadership. And that are, I'm talking about the people who make decisions about when that equipment will be pulled out. It is patently ridiculous to, be a, to bring a tank to a pumpkin festival. Some of the things we saw in Ferguson that inflamed the country were an inappropriate display of that military equipment. 
you need to have strong leadership that has the courage to tell officers what kind of behavior is okay and not, and where, where the equipment should be used. But I think it would be a terrible disservice to our communities to say you have to pick one or the other. So, so you, you, you spoke in your opening on this particular motion about you have concerns about a culture, but yes. you, you say it's, it, but you think the equipment is necessary, but we heard Vikrant yes. explicitly say, and Paul Butler, you know, more implicitly said, the equipment kind of affects the culture that one that, you know, especially Vikrant said, you know, young men get these guns, they want to use them. And that's why you need strong leaders. <laughs> but, 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 but I want to ask you, do you think that's a real dynamic? Do you think that, that the weapons sort of attract a kind of certain either individual or uh, elicit a certain kind of behavior? So driving fast with lights and siren and having guns, yeah, that, that is going to attract people that are attracted to, to excitement and adventure. We have to look at how we recruit police officers, but we can't, we can't discard important equipment because we don't have strong enough leadership to manage the culture of their agency. We need to pay more attention to that. Would anybody on the panel like to suggest what equipment should be discarded that's now in the hands of police forces? Me, 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 me. Go, me. Paul, sure. Um, how about the, the bayonets and the grenade launchers? I agree. Remember President Obama didn't uh, take away everything, he took away those, and the cops were mad about that. That's why Attorney General Not said- Not all the cops. Done. Well, en enough that he got a standing ovation at the FOP convention when he announced that they were getting the bayonets back. But, you know, the issue isn't only the specific warlike weapons, it's as Sue said, the culture. So 80% of police arrests are for Nonviolent crimes, things like jumping a turn with a subway style, not paying tickets, poking weed in public. Clearly, you don't need warrior equipment for that. Again, even for the more serious crimes, you don't need the bayonets and the grenades. The problem, very quickly, is Sue talked about the TV show SWAT. Jason used a phrase I really like. He said, engage in a dialogue. That's how police make serious cases like homicide. They run chasing the bad guys like you see in SWAT. Think of law and order. All they do in law and order is go from one office to a home, to a park, to a garage, talking to people. And if your experience with cops is that they're warriors, they're out to get you and to lock you up, you're not gonna wanna talk to them, which is why the police don't solve most crimes, including most serious crimes. Does anybody not agree that there's a culture problem? Does anybody feel that that's exaggerated? Or is there, gen and, then, and it's fine if you all agree on something, even though it's a debate, because we're trying to shed light. Do you all agree that there's actually essentially a cultural problem in police forces that, in, in the sense of being too militarized? I think, Rafael, you were- I disagree in a yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I disagree in the following way. To the extent that there has been a cultural shift toward militarization, I have yet to hear any evidence connecting that culture with the kind of negative outcomes that are bringing us to this table here today, right? It's there the is trust. The, the no, negative. The negative outcome is broken trust. Not we're not. It's not about the crime rate or the number of shootings. It's caused a break in public trust. And, right. But if you look at levels of public trust in Gallup polls or other polling, of, you know, over the last two decades, trust in the police has remained essentially constant. Uh, again, I just have yet to hear any kind of, of, of causal evidence actually linking the two together. What we see, uh, I, 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 crime, crime, ha crime has data. gone down. Crime has gone down. Training has improved, but trust right. hasn't. And and the the uh, clearance rate for homicide is sixty percent in Chicago. The clearance rate for shooting is lower than twenty percent. That's your evidence. Again, make those cases is when the community trust you. When the community doesn't trust you, they don't talk to the cops. And then we I, So Raphael, you're, you're, you're hearing Raphael. Argument. Yeah, Raphael, I think you're being told nobody's questioning your numbers. And at Intelligence Squared, we appreciate people who bring numbers and evidence. But I think they're saying they're not relevant, that they're not, they're not the relevant metric. And so yeah, I, take that I, on. I, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm understanding why that's so. Right? I, I understand the mechanics of the argument that, that, that trust is, is somehow um, you know, uh, being affected by this this militarization. But is there really any evidence that police were trusted to a higher degree in the 1970s by the black community on the south and west side of Chicago? I don't think that there is. 
Um, what, you know, yeah, are, are, are there low clearance rates in some jurisdictions as compared to others? Yeah, but the clearance rate in New York City is significantly higher and you, you, you can actually see that, that we have just as much militarization. And again, I would just point to the data from Chicago SWAT. They are, are involved in 0.003% of all uses of force by police in that city. I have yet to see SWAT officers enforcing the kind of nonviolent crimes that Professor Butler uh, uh, has noted. The reality is, is that they are not involved in that kind of enforcement effort. There, there are some shows of authority, you know, through rolling the tanks down when there's a riot or a protest, but the evidence uh, shows pretty clearly that that's actually associated with good things. Again, one last one last study I'll point to, Olubenga Agilor, a senior economist, a very liberal Center for American Progress, did a study of the 1033 program and found, quote, little evidence of a causal link between general military surplus acquisition and a documented use of force incident. In fact, the acquisition of military vehicles leads to fewer use of force incidents. And that is because of the other data that show that that kind of show of force actually deters criminal behavior, which minimizes those kinds of fraud interactions that I think we're all worried about. All right, about. Jason Johnson, 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 Johnson let, me, let me bring in Jason. Uh, he hasn't had, okay, uh, Paul, take on every corner. I'm John, sorry, I, Paul, I, 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 I was talking over you, Paul, and I wanna hear what you had to say, and then I wanna go to Jason. No, I was just saying uh, what we heard just from Vic is a great argument for uh, a tank and a bayonet on every street corner in Chicago. Jason? Well, there you have it, John. The question was, is anyone exaggerating the issue of militarization? And I think we just heard it. Um, American police are not using bayonets. They're not using uh, grenade launchers. And that's a great talking point. That's a great thing to say to, to attract attention to this, but that's actually not happening. Uh, the, I don't know what happened at the FOP convention. My, I suspect that maybe the attorney general said that they were going to open the 1033 program back up. I can promise you if he mentioned bayonets or uh, grenade launchers, that would not elicit a positive response. But it's not police equipment and it's not used by police in America. So I, I think really we just need to focus on what the real issues are and not just, um, you know, inject a bunch of exaggerated rhetoric as well. We, we, all, we also need to, we need to identify better metrics for comparison purposes, because if the only thing you're looking at is crime rates and uses of force, you're missing the point of, and I will agree with Paul, public trust is critical to reducing the crime rate. We don't have a good way to measure public trust and we don't, don't have a good way to determine what actually improves public trust and what actually diminishes it. We just have to draw some conclusions from our own experiences. We don't have a good way to measure public trust, but I, I can think of one small study that I saw that, that shows the way trust declines in kind of an interesting way. I think it's worth bringing into the conversation. There was a uh, awful incident of police violence in Milwaukee several years ago. There was a study done that showed that in the immediate aftermath of this incident, calls to 911 declined precipitously. Now, that doesn't mean the crime rate declined. Crime rate stayed what it was. But people just had lost confidence in the police. They'd lost confidence in the state and government. That's a tragic situation. Those kinds of studies are fairly common. I, but they're I not, but... agree entirely. And, 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 I, and I think we ought to be moved by that. Uh, and, and in my recent testimony to the President's Commission on Law Enforcement, I actually noted that study from the American Sociological Review in 2016, which actually showed that. And I think it's concerning. What's important, though, to realize is that we're currently talking about police militarization. And as far as I can see, there have been no incidents in which SWAT officers are the ones driving that or in which this, there's a connection between that sense of mistrust, that kind of reaction, and the militarization that we're talking about. I think we are making a very large logical leap here, um, potentially with, with some negative consequences to the extent that we act on that. Tell that to Brianna Taylor. If you look at the way that cops execute search warrants in communities of color, including for drugs, uh, it's often with these hyper-militaristic actions. And to respond to Jason, I'm not exaggerating. The logical extension of the idea that having military equipment on streets makes people safer is that in crime plague, violence plague, plague communities, if you have a, a tank on every corner, uh, then we'll be safer. You know, there's never been a question that civil liberties and the idea that we live in a democracy where the police and the military don't run stuff uh, is at some tension with whether people commit crimes. And so we resolve that tension in a way that respects our democracy. And when the police who are supposed to serve and protect and keep us safe are warriors, that doesn't resolve that tension in the right direction. Well, we don't want we don't want to have police departments filled, you know, with just 
uh, binary warriors. But if you are have the misfortune of being involved in a very dangerous situation like an active shooter, I'm sure when you're laying under the desk, you're going to be wishing that a warrior shows up. So, Sue Rar, you, you were talking before about the need for people to be able to perform both functions. But does that mean, right. as Jason just said, you want the warrior to show up? Do police departments need to have warriors? Police departments need to have complete police officers. And a complete police officer has the ability to, to balance properly between defending people's civil rights and defending their physical safety. I, I got pushback when I talked about this whole concept of warriors and guardians. And, and one of the arguments got resolved this way. We have, we have canine officers, we have, we have police dogs that we can train to track down a suspect and they, they can be extremely dangerous. We can take that same dog into a kindergarten classroom and the dog wags its tail and licks the children in the face. If a dog is smart enough to be able to appropriately respond, then I think a police officer can do both things too.